joining us for the Explore the Arts Theater Lookout with the cast of The Guardsman. Explore the Arts is a program of the Kennedy Center's Education Department presenting lectures, classes, and discussions for adult audiences both on-site and online. To find out more about Explore the Arts programming, visit us on the web at kennedy-center.org slash club. Explore the Arts, part of the Rubenstein Arts Access Program, is generously funded by David and Alice Rubenstein. I'm your moderator for today's look-in, Leslie Jacobson. I'm a professor of theater at the George Washington University. And it's my great honor and pleasure to welcome three of the uh, stars of The Guardsman. And I'll start when I'm right, introducing Sarah Wayne Cowley, who has very much done for all of these three artists, resume from TV, film, and stage work. Um, she, she, some of you may know her as Lily Brown from The Walking Dead. She's also been on Prison Break, and you can join the Prince of some uh, uh, roles on uh, other uh, drama TV shows. We've got Law and Order, SVU, and Cats, and a number of other shows. Acting and screenwriting in film, including a, some very interesting international work. She was in Black November, which is a Nigerian film, and it was the first film to be screened for the UN General Assembly. I'm not sure if you know that, but I don't know. Um, so, in terms of training, Sarah got an MFA from the National Theater Conservatory and a BA from Shaw. And to her right is Finn Woodcock. He has a number of credits, again, for Broadway, Off-Broadway, regional art, and TV and film, but probably uh, a wonderful Broadway credit as being Jeff Jackman. Um, some of the regional, uh, Off-Broadway theater, she worked at Police for Theater Company in New York, Classic Theater Company, and uh, regional theater such as Chicago Goodman Theater, and our own Shakespeare Theater Company here in D.C. Also recently the Red Crown and Shakespeare Theater Festival, TV and film. Uh, his, his training comes from Juilliard, and he's a member of the Mechanical Theater Group in Los Angeles. And finally, to his right is Julie Halston, a Brown Desk nominee last year for Charles Dickens' Dickens Song and Shakespeare, and has had other, many other Broadway and Off-Broadway credits, including Anything Goes, Hairspray, Dixie, and um, personal favorite of mine, Rock Love. Um, she's a founding member of Charles Dickens Theater in Limbo. Um, she's done a lot of TV work, including creating the role of Dixie Von Mutton on Sex in the City. And is also an author. Uh, she's the co-author with Donna Bailey of Monologues to Show Off, which is a resource for actors, casting directors, and features of actors. So um, welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for coming. And towards the end, um, we'll make some questions that you'd like to ask, and we'll ask the audience to give you the opportunity to do that. Um, but the first thing I wanted to ask, since this is a play, uh, Molnar, The Guardsman, was written earlier in the 20th century, a lot earlier in the 20th century. Um, it's a kind of a classic. Uh, I think the theater here actually produced it first in New York. Um, and so I'm just curious if you were familiar with this play before getting cast in it. Do you, did you know it? Have you been uh, once in the film version or anything before you came to it? I had never seen it. Uh, I had heard about it because um, it was actually done very recently at Berkshire Theater Festival. Yeah. And I go up there a lot. And, um, and then so what I did was I actually YouTubed uh, a little bit of the Luntz uh, in, in the Guardsman. I had always sort of heard about it as a sort of summer stock situation, mm -hmm. so I was not particularly entranced with the idea, <laughs> but the idea that Richard Nelson, who was a playwright I very, very much respect and uh, love his work, uh, when I heard that he had adapted a whole nother situation, I was really intrigued, and I remember calling my agent and saying, uh, you know, get me that script. So that's why I was intrigued. Great. Yeah. 
What about the Beirut? Yeah, I had never heard of it before. Um, I, uh, I, I, I was interested by the idea that it was a rediscovery of an old play, that it was sort of a new old play, and that, well, when, when I think when someone you really respect is, becomes obsessed with a play, um, it's, it makes you take notice, you know? So, and it seemed like Richard Nelson and Gregory Moser, our director, had, had found, stumbled upon something that they thought was really unique and cool and hadn't been done before. Because Richard really went back to the original, um, and the translation that we have now is much closer to what that was. Versus the Luntz version, right. as magnificent as they are, was sort right. of a... Right, it was light, it was kind of... Yeah, um, they brought... The, the comedy, yeah. Comedy. yeah, yeah, which has an—I mean, there's an art to that, mm -hmm. you know. I think mm -hmm. that they just found some more uh, complication in it. Yeah. So. Yeah. And the book on TV? Nope, hadn't read it. <laughs> hadn't heard of it. Uh, turns out my cousin was in a summer stock production of it oh like God. 20 years ago or something. But <laughs> um, no, it didn't. There was nothing. I, I brought nothing to it except reading it for what it was. Which is actually wonderful, you know, yeah. I mean, the, the summer sketch. Um, but it is kind of fun. This production, by the way, if you haven't had a chance to see it yet, is wonderful. And I just think you've been so patient to the material. And the material that Richard Nelson has adapted is so rich. But if you want to see a theater legend perform on film, it's kind of fun to see the, uh, the movie version from the very early 30s. Mm. Uh, because it might be one of the only uh, times that you get you get to see the lens. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, right. But it is very stagey. I mean, it's not like his production at all. W when we're done, I'm going to watch it. Yeah. 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 That would be Still fun to do. <laughs> but our set designer night. just yeah. won a Tony yeah. Award on Sunday night oh, that's oh, yeah. for yeah. the Nance, and he just won a Tony Award. And when you know, not that I'm pushing the sets and costumes, you know, <laughs> hopefully you'll enjoy the play and our performances, but. <laughs> It is an absolutely magnificent. But if you don't, it's beautiful to look at. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's an absolutely gorgeous production <laughs> it, it, of it, it, the guardsmen that are being fact, done here. I have a question about that music. Okay. <laughs> um, so a, a sort of follow-on question to this is, because this is set in 1910, although the play has resonance for contemporary audiences, but I mean, the, the setting of the play is 1910, and it's beautiful. I'm just curious if you did any kind of research, uh, historical or contextual research, and that, you know, or, or if that's part of your process, and so you need to now you have a different answer about that. But uh, what did you do to put yourself in Budapest or whatever, et cetera? You know, it's funny, I, I think when you like, graduate drama school, you get really into the research thing, <laughs> and you see like, what are the, you know, imports and exports of Budapest? I mean, like, you, right. you know, <laughs> like, you, like, really yeah. those, like, things become really important, and then, and then you start to realize that, you know, what, you look, go after the things that will help you, you know, you become more discerning, I think. So, what, what helped me was learning more about Molnar, the writer, and mm -hmm. his, his past and his history, and, um, he was incredibly prolific, and he was a newspaper man um, and a writer of comedies, and um, and a neurotic. Like he was crazy. <laughs> I mean, in a great way. In a yeah. He was a brilliant. Um, but kind of getting into his head has really kind of opened the play up for me, mm -hmm. cracked it, and um, especially for you because you're arguably playing him Molnar. in a way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because he did. He was in an asylum because of woman that he, he his wife, married. Was, yeah, uh, who cheated on him with someone rich and famous, I don't know. At least one. Yeah, at least <laughs> one, yeah. <laughs> and he, went, I mean, he, he wrote it from an asylum, so they say. Yeah. Um, so learning about him, and he was a big deal, like he's a, really a lost legend. I mean, he wrote, you know, Lilium, which was right. Carousel, but he also, like in New York, was, was everyone was doing his plays in the 19 the teens. Right. Um, yeah. Um, so f yeah, that that was the most revealing thing to me. But we all, we did some we had great pictures of the opera house. Like the the set is based on the actual opera house that's in yeah. Budapest, and uh, 
you know, you find the things that help you. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm you know, <laughs> we've talked about this. I'm so not a research person. I'm like, <laughs> I am so old school. It's like, what, where do I stand? What are my lines? You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and I will barely look at you, and I will, <coughs> I will not relate to you as an actor, and I will just do my lines, I will get my laugh, and I will get off. And that's my kind of view of acting, which is a little sad on a certain level, but it's worked for 30 years. But, <laughs> yeah. but, but I do think one of the things that I actually learned from this process is, and this is something that I really enjoyed about working with Finn and Sarah and Gregory and Richard, is, um, and it's, it is different, and I did have to approach things differently. You know, because I do so much comedy in New York and uh, my own performances and whatnot, it's a very different process. Uh, it's much more laugh-based, you know, and I am a laugh whore, believe me. But you have to approach things differently when you are actually working with other people. You <laughs> might want to look at them <laughs> occasionally. Um, and you have to, I mean, I had to learn a little German, yeah. you know, and I actually had to do this. And I actually really did research. And it did make the experience so much rich, richer. Mm -hmm. And um, what Finn was talking about with Molnar is very, very um, poignant. And, uh, but it also added to the sort of frisson of the whole situation. And um, it, it, it's, it's a much richer experience when you actually do a, you know, you don't not have to go crazy and micromanage the research, but I think a broad understanding of the time, mm -hmm. uh, the situation is, is, is very enriching. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I, I went straight into the like, Imports and exports. I mean, you know, <laughs> she's I, missed research. No, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, my parents are university professors, um, and actually, it was incredibly helpful. I mean, so mm -hmm. 1910 was a time from literature and aviation that the whole world was turning upside down. And so, to be able, when I when I first read the play, I thought, how does this woman believe she can get away with this? And the answer to me was in a lot of just the historical and kind of socio political changes that were going on. Anything is possible. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, beyond that, to me, it was more of a cultural aesthetic question. You know, we, the Luntz version of this play was a bit of a drawing room comedy. Yeah. And it was very Western European and very English and kind of prim and all of that. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm Hungarian and Czech, and we're not like that. And I, I didn't <laughs> really, you know what I mean? I don't know if there's any so, Eastern Europeans in the house, but we don't go like this. Um, <laughs> And, you know, I, I didn't really realize, I mean, forgive me, this is going to sound, feel free to hit me for this. It's probably the most pretentious thing I'll ever say. I didn't understand Chekhov until I read War and Peace. And there is an Eastern European dynamic mm -hmm. of, they are constantly in tears and laughing and, you know, there's an intensity to that. And that, um, in research-wise, that I think was probably the most important thing to bring to the play for me. Yeah, no, I think that's wonderful. It, 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 it is so interesting, too, what you say about um, air travel and motor travel and all these things were exploding, and it was four years before the war. Yeah. So even though tensions were rising in Europe, still it was a time of, of peace and expansion and prosperity yeah. and all that. And, and a kind of weird innocence, which is in this play. You know, yeah. just what you say, that to think that this woman can get away with a life that she leads and, and you know, uh, having affairs or whatever, um, but anything is possible in, in that kind of rarefied world. The other thing that I kind of love, and I'm just curious how you respond to it, art was so important in these European cities. You know, and you were the ruling male and female actor of this, City, you know, this cultural capital of Budapest. Yeah. You know, everybody knows you. You can go everywhere. I, I mean, I don't know if you know the film To Be or Not to Be. Yeah, we watched it. We watched it. Okay, with Jack Benny yeah. and Caroline uh, Alumni. To me, more than any more than the old Lunch Fun Ten movie, you both reminded me of that movie in the best way possible. Nice. Ah, nice. That's, yes. that's a great. We, that's, that's, we, that's good. That great was, we, that we loved that movie. Oh, I, me yeah. too. Me too. I, I watch it every chance I get. It, but, but just, you know, 
that with the young flyer, Robert Saxon, you know, if you don't know Maria Sura, you know, mm -hmm. if right. you're in this case, uh, you know, 30 years old or whatever, but if you don't know her, you're not living with her. I mean, that, that mm -hmm. everybody knew who you were. Yeah. I think in a way that um, people know celebrities now, Same. but I'm not sure they know artists in that mm -hmm. way now. I mean, I don't know if you guys have any mm -hmm. opinions on that. I mean, do you think that there are people like that today in, in, in today's culture? Well, artistic culture wasn't as diffuse as it is now. You know, I mean, I, I think even 15, 20 years ago, you had three channels right. and a limited number of movies, and not everybody was, you know, I mean, so if there was a, it was a more, um, the artists that were dominant had a sort of greater mm -hmm. cultural hegemony because there were only so many things that people were exposed right. to. Right. And, and so, but it also gave people, I think, a common cultural reference point mm -hmm. that we don't have now. Mm -hmm. Because we don't have two artists that everyone has seen. Right. These yeah, plays, or these paintings, or this music. It was local then. Bud and Budapest yeah, was a flowering yeah. arts community. I mean, it was, um, yeah. Well, also now, too, like we have couples that are celebrated, obviously. We know about this. But, you know, even our language is different. You know, we call them power couples. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, Marie and the actor, the actor and the actress are not power couples. They were celebrated artists. Right. You know, nobody would be like, you know, the power couple. Right. It's a different, it's a different, um, it's a different value, mm -hmm. to be honest. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, it's, a, it's, I find it a little poignant, I have to say. Yeah. I do mm -hmm. find it poignant. Interestingly, though, the, the, the woman who played like the companion to Carol Lombard, in that movie, To Be or Not yeah. To Be, that you referenced, was actually the mother in the movie of The Guardsman. Really? <laughs> yes. Like yes. Oh, but yeah, Maud Eben. Dry wit, and she sees right through. Yes, her, yes. Her, which, of course, I think you do so beautifully in this production. But that is, that, that's. It was fabulous to put I that know, together. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, the other thing that I think you both communicate so wonderfully is you are the. You are the centers of your universe. And I think, you know, we all at times feel that way about ourselves, but in the world that we're describing, you kind of were the centers of the universe. You know what I mean? That that um, whether you were going to really stay together, whether she was going to be faithful to you or not, whether you were going to have this affair or not, was kind of life and death um, for, you know, in your world and in other people's worlds as well. So that's kind of interesting. One thing that is similar, I mean, there is the public persona that we have, and then there is what's actually happening in our relationship, you know? And, and I think um, those are, could not be more opposite. You know, I think that he, that that was topical humor then, mm -hmm. you know, that there, he was referencing someone or, you know, a group of people who everyone in the audience would sort of be in on the joke, right. you know? Um, oh, that's an interesting thing. Yeah. Well, and there's that great moment where, you know, you're playing this sad music and you're so upset and you're so upset and then the guy with the girl Yeah, comes exactly. In and suddenly <laughs> it's the happy little family. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, the next question that I had that relates to what you were saying about costumes and the set. Um, we often think of costumes in uh, theater as the second skin of the actor, and the costumes were fabulous. And one of the things that was so wonderful was what you were talking about, Sarah. They weren't purely, it wasn't just designs by work or designs, you know, from Paris. It was, it had very much of an Eastern feel, you know, they, it, which <coughs> gave it a sort of exotic and sexualized and, you know, sort of mysterious air, which I yeah. thought was wonderful. And the set, of course, was beautiful sets. Um, but I guess my question is, since a lot of the rehearsal process is done looking at the renderings that, you know, they take on the floor and the rehearsal space and whatever, um, anything you want to say about what happened when you finally got to work on the show with the costumes and how that 
change things for me or give me something for me at that point. Why don't you have to kiss a mustache or tell me? <laughs> yeah, going from fin to spirit gum was a great <laughs> step down. I mean, you know, um, I got to say, for me, probably more than for these two, but I, you know, I've been working in television and film for the last 10 years. I hadn't done a play hmm. in 10 years. Wow. And I've been playing very contemporary characters. And to move into a period world, the corsets and the skirts, but the femininity and what happens to a woman's power mm. when you translate a woman who's every bit as powerful and intelligent as the women I've been playing, but you move her back 110 years yeah. um, or 103. It, it was extraordinary. And when I first had the fittings, I panicked because I thought, I don't know how to seduce a man this covered up. I haven't had to do it. You know what I mean? Like, haven't had to do it. Mm. And, <laughs> True. Um, but it, it's, yeah. it's a very different, the first few days in costume, it changes the way your whole body has to move because you have to be able to communicate something with your back through five layers of yeah. muslin. It's, it was a huge transition for me. Um, probably less so for these guys, but yeah, it threw me for a massive loop <laughs> for about 72 hours. Any other I don't find my performance until I get into the costume, to be honest. I mean, that's just, I'm so old fashioned, I guess that way. It's that sort of Laurence Olivier thing of outside in rather than inside out. You said that the first day of rehearsal. I, I remember did. You saying It's that. like, I, hmm. first of all, I hate rehearsing. I am such a result-oriented person. I have learned to um, tolerate rehearsal, but I don't like it. It's uncomfortable, it's vulnerable, I don't feel good in it. It's just a terrible process for me. Um, I am so opposite from this, but I have garnered such respect for like working with Sarah and Finn because they, it, watching them go through this process was very, very um, uh, in, instructive. But probably because of my work with Charles Bush, because we had a theater company where we had to do shows every two weeks. Mm -hmm. It was almost like in rep. Yeah. And sometimes we actually did do rep. Um, and Charles's costumes were always very elaborate, and we always wore a lot, a lot of wigs and whatnot. And we would literally rehearse with them very quickly from the start, mm -hmm. so it was hard for me to be out of costume and out of a wig. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I'm, you know, like I said, I, the minute I got into mothers, you know, even like, she has two very different looks, um, I found myself, you know, standing differently, and literally the what comes out of your mouth is different, I find. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's just a different process. Yeah, understood. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for you, probably, the biggest challenge was a piece of fabric because men's clothing had to change so drastically. Although maybe it's not. Collars. Collars. <laughs> oh, yes, the collar. <laughs> fin V collar oh. every night. <laughs> War. Um, yeah, the, I mean, the play is, from my point of view, about putting on a disguise. Mm -hmm. um, and so, the costume became the character. You know, I think that, I think back then, even they talk about the Lunts, like going to Paris and spending way too much money getting costumes, because yeah. that was, it was really, really important to them. And learning about how actors used to, I mean, your costume was, you took it with you to, when you went to the provinces. It, yeah. You had your Hamlet costume and your mm -hmm. own Skull, in our case, you know, like, <laughs> right. it, yes. like before directors, it was, you know, it, yeah. there was a stage manager who kind of like helped with blocking, but um, people didn't have a director, you know, no. rehe and rehearsal was just sort of where we go yeah. here, and then we're just going to do it. And yeah. mm -hmm. The stars going, were kind of leading the pack. Oh, mm -hmm. completely, yeah. 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 And yeah, and taking center and th giving yeah. their speech, and then, <laughs> right. you know, and they're, and everyone else would sort of figure it out around them. Yes. Uh, so yeah, that was really interesting to learn about is like how the pre-director theater yeah. operated. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but costumes, um, yeah, they, they, you're right. They, 
they give you a they give you a outside skeleton. Yeah, and yeah. we were so lucky because we, we were early. working with such amazing designers. Yeah. Our lighting designer, our costume designer, and our set designer are so extraordinary and so detailed in their research um, that it, it really helps. I get so inspired by designers that so often I will find that not, not uh, I of course have great respect for my director, um, but frequently I find inspiration through the designers. And I find mm. myself, interestingly, I can talk to designers sometimes a little um, more forthcoming. I, I can be more forthcoming sometimes with designers, mm. uh, probably because you always get a little nervous, like, oh, well, is the director going to you know, take this as a sort of slight of his or her idea or whatever? But I find that designers, I get so inspired by them. And, um, you know, it, it, it helps. It yeah. really helps. Well, it, 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 the um, physical production of the costumes and the sets, I thought, really did create a world which you then brought to life because you inhabited it so authentically. But it was really very tremendous. Very it's done. lush. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was going to ask uh, this is, as we pointed out, an old story. It's a new adaptation of it, and Ricky Nelson is a, a, new, a mar remarkable playwright, working playwright today. Was there were there any rewrites? I mean, in other words, did you just get the script and then you and Roger Ebert sort of did it, or was did he did the, the playwright have to go to rehearsal hall? And, yeah. Oh yeah. So is that in that sense, it was a little bit like working on a new play. It does. It feels like a new play with this like blueprint behind it that you could yeah. go, keep going mm -hmm. and referencing. Um, he was Richard came down a couple times and he was with us for most of tech and all that, right? For yeah, like ten days or something before yeah. we opened, yeah. I think. And there would be little changes. There was a version that like he wrote like that was much longer that was much more closer to like the line by line literal mm -hmm. translation. Mm -hmm. um, and he made a lot of cuts because it was just a little, it was just too long, right. yeah. right. you know. So and, and it was, a, a, yeah, yeah, and repetitive, and, and jokes that we don't get anymore, like right. about Eleanor Duza. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I get them. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry. sorry. Uh, you're my Google. So right. need, who needs I'm Google just old. Have, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Um, but yeah, he was very involved. So it did feel like working on a living, breathing play. I, I felt. Yeah, and he time. would, you know, there were times when they, a scene would have been trimmed maybe a little more aggressively than it needed to be, and they'd come up and yeah. throw a couple Fine. lines in, and all of a sudden you go, oh, oh, that's, oh, that's enormously helpful. I didn't real, I was going this way, and those two lines kind of bring you back. Right. Um, but probably less of that than you would get with a brand new play. A brand new play. Yeah. Yeah, it was right. a yeah. relatively stable script. Yeah. yeah, you know. Yeah, and it, that's the good thing about the play is that it's a solid. It, like you feel like you're on solid ground. Mm -hmm. There are yeah. some plays that you feel like tonight it works, tomorrow night it really might not work. <laughs> you know, like yeah. we might just fall into a, some quicksand. And, right. Well, it's, no. it's, a, it's the structure. That's really yeah, the structure is so solid, and yeah. so you can yeah. dance on top of you it. You can trust the play. Yeah, you can, you can absolutely it. trust the play. And throughout rehearsal, what we kept finding was when we were going off it's because we weren't trusting the play. We were putting something else yeah. on or taking something else away. And it was, I mean, Gregory even said this, which, you know, his experience is sort of vast compared to put the three of us together. But he said, I don't know if I've ever worked on a play where so much of what you mean is what you're saying. Wow. There's, it's not, it's not a huge amount of subtext. It's not a ton of double speak. That's it's really not true. overwhelmingly yeah, ironic really or sarcastic. Yeah, we kept saying that, like, yeah. what if I just mean what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> like, what, a, what a profound kind of idea. You really can. It is like Shakespeare, yeah. 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 Wonderful. And it also made me think of Shakespeare because it is about the language. I mean, I think that you all infuse it with a lot of wonderful physicality, so it isn't just talking heads by any means. But it's a lot of words, and that isn't so much the way plays are written nowadays. Right. Um, yeah. And or television, I mean, for that matter. So, what did that feel like at first? Was it like, oh my god, <laughs> all 
<laughs> I think what was so what's so great is that, and and this was my big lesson, um, is you know Gregory really pushed us to just go simpler, go simpler, go simpler, you know, trust that what you're saying is what you mean, but you can go simpler, you can go simpler, you know. And um, that was very important. And they have, all, they have a lot of words. I, you know, I come on, I say, go to hell, and I walk off, so it's great. I, and then you, you know, say it in so German. Yeah, yeah, and that's it, you know, and then I do some, whatever. There's a lot, yeah, there's a lot of words. But there's a lot of words. But, um, a lot of talking. But um, it was surprisingly easy to memorize because um, it's very logical. It's very, it's meticulous and detailed, and, and one thought follows the next. Like, it, it's hard to learn when you can't follow the logic that's driving the play. You know, that's what's right. difficult. Is it's almost impossible to learn bad writing. Yeah, yeah, it's so much it's harder. Really Even hard if it's not that much, writing. you know? But it's like, oh, oh, this follows, this follows, this. Once you get that pattern, then the, it's, the, it sticks to your brain, mm -hmm. you know? I definitely did call my last leading man, though, from The Walking Dead, and I was like, Andy, I say more in two and a half hours of this play than I did in three years on the show. <laughs> like, I am so intimidated. I was almost off book by the time we started rehearsal because I just thought it can't be me. Like the, the one holding up this process can't be me. You know, you don't think about it, right? You audition for something mm -hmm. and then you get it and you go, all right, what have I gotten myself into? And I kept reading and I went, oh my Lord, I'm in that and I'm in that. And I got, oh, so you went through how many highlighters? Three. You killed three highlighters going through Dried the script. Dried them. <laughs> they just gave up and left. But it, <laughs> you handled it so beautifully. And something else that I just want to compliment you on is one of the things that is different about theater in 1910 than theater in 2013 are, are sort of stylistic choices. You know what I mean? Actors, like if we were to see Sarah Bernhardt today, we now you scream, or even Lisa, you know, what seemed so authentic and so real then would probably seem stagey to us now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so there's a kind of fullness and largeness that you were talking about, that kind of Slavic mm -hmm. soul, you know, the, the, the and, but but it's it's real. You, you know what I mean? They're not mm -hmm. just affecting it. And they and you both are the most realistic, naturalistic actors of your day. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought that you sort of captured the spirit of that. I mean, with all of the the emotional ups and downs, and you know, throwing yourself on the kit, the cushions, and you know, getting up, and you know, looking out the window, and are you going to toss yourself out the window? But, but that, I think, that's the world that these people lived in, and that's what they brought to the stage. And we and we might look at those kinds of actors today and say, oh, they're too human to get them off the stage. But that's who these people were. And, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I don't know if that was something conscious in the back of your head or just in fulfilling the script, you were able to get there. That's true. Yeah, it's, it's a tricky situation. Well, I live like these people, yeah, so I don't, is. you know, I call everyone darling, and I do throw myself on cushions, and that's the way I operate. So to me, Sarah Bernhardt is, is, is exactly normal behavior. All right. But, um, but I appreciate so much that, that, and I think this is the genius of what Gregory and, and Richard and, and my colleagues have achieved, which is we are so into watching this gorgeous, fabulous, naturalistic couple also be, you know, theatrical and emotional, right. and right. but there's not a thread of the cringeworthy artificiality. I, it, it's a very mm -hmm. fine balance, and I think they're so skilled that they achieve it. And you know, again, it's um, why do we go to the theater? Right. That's this is a theatrical event. Right. We want to see this kind of thing, but the inherent structure of the piece and what the piece is saying is so poignant and mm -hmm. realistic mm -hmm. and what's going on today. It's about right. marriage. Absolutely. That we can all relate to it. it it's going back to the Olivier thing we are talking about, uh, outside in or inside Somewhere. out acting. And um, maybe, I don't know, maybe we're different. I don't know. Um, sometimes, sometimes you realize where the play has to go, like it has to reach this height emotionally or, or whatever. It, it, it has to get to this point. Mm -hmm. 
And sometimes you just have to push yourself there even if it's you're not ready. Like even if you're not supported, like you don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Like you have to jump into it and then that's what rehearsal is about, is then mm -hmm. figuring out how do I actually make this, how do I actually substantiate this mm -hmm. and make this, mm -hmm. you know, something believable. Yeah. The play sense. tells us exactly where we need to go. I mean, again, I think it's a great play yeah. because mm -hmm. it does, you got to get from here to here. And what's kind of wonderful about it is a, I think Molnar truncates a lot of the logic. You know, like mm -hmm. normal people might take 20 minutes to get from here right. to here. Right. These two, Just it's one, well, boom. Stream. Right. And it's, right. you know, right. which is interesting to watch, but it also means you can't overthink things too much. Yeah. You know, you're, mm -hmm. you have to you're having a, a war. And now you're in right. tears, and now you've won, right. and now you're back to the war, and you yeah, can't you play each thing fully. Yeah, and yeah. Then, and then drop it when it moves on. There were definitely awful days of rehearsal, though. You know, I mean, oh, yeah. I remember there were a couple days where I was like, I mean, our big joke was call Katie Holmes. You know, what I mean, I was like, <laughs> Katie Holmes and Shia LaBeouf are going to be coming in yeah, yeah, yeah. and <laughs> taking over. I mean, because you just. You do. You, you're like, all right, we're just going to take the risk today. And sometimes you take the risk, yeah. and you're like, and that didn't That's, work at all. Right. Yeah. That was right. embarrassing. And eight people who I really respect just saw it happen. <laughs> you leave rehearsal and be like, beer? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, there, were, there were more than a few of those days, at least for me. Yeah. No, it's but, totally but you know what's interesting? We watched with Gregory, our director, um, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, mm. with Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burke. And you know, when, it, when he first brought up that we were going to watch this movie, I was like, oh, well, I love the film, and it's great, and I've seen it, but what, what the hell are we watching this for mm -hmm. with the guardsmen? I mean, yeah, it's a marriage and all that. But what Sarah just said was so interesting because they go from there to there real quick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a celebrated couple. I mean, you couldn't get more celebrated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there they are in this piece, and their emotional ups and downs are lickety-split. Right. Yeah. Really quick right. silver. And we so bought full. every one of them. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. And that did actually help us, I think, mm -hmm. yeah. with this mm -hmm. idea. It's like, oh, that's possible. Oh, it's yeah. really possible yeah. to just, yeah, yeah, just say, oh, okay, darling. Oh, hug the hostess or whatever, you yeah. know, right. like, and mm -hmm. somehow you're going to buy it. Yeah. And because it's great writing. Yeah. And it gives you permission, too, to put all of your good manners away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Be mm -hmm. like, yeah. this is not how I'd behave. But right. right. Sorry, I'm going to torture writing. you yeah. for the next 20 minutes. It comes down to yeah. that. Yeah. Well, you know, I think uh, the things that you're saying, too, are reminders. I think with uh, people growing up now and seeing so much television, which is wonderful. I mean, there's fabulous stuff going on on television. But it's a small screen. It's small feelings sometimes to be, you know, or, or the big feelings, but they're sort of being held in check that I see working with acting students at George Washington, they're sometimes afraid for these big, bold moments. And as you say, sometimes you have to do it and then fill it yeah. um, uh, or take the chance. But uh, it feels sometimes like small is real. And if you do anything else, it's not real. And so to, to watch you in this play, and of course, there are hundreds of other examples, as you point out, um, but you know, coming to see the guardsmen is a reminder that big is real too. Um, and, and you know, all you have to do is go out on the street and hear people screaming at each other or shoving each other or whatever's going on or, or grabbing each other in joy and big is real. But I, but I think it's hard sometimes to get there because we don't want to be inauthentic on stage. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you, you guys did it. <laughs> that's lovely. Yeah. Um, we, uh, uh, we're going to open it up to some questions in a moment, but I just had a couple of other things I wanted to ask. One is um, just if you were going to uh, talk to some, someone who wanted a career in theater or wanted to become an actor or a career in acting, whether it's theater, film, or television, uh, in terms of your own experience in your training or what life lessons you've learned since then? Any advice, or what, what would you say are one or two of the most important things for, the, for them to keep in mind as they pursue their dream? Patience. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. I would say know thyself. I mean, it's very important to know who you are and what you want in life. I mean, this is sort of just a dictum for everything, but 
it's so important to really have a sense of who you are, how you are being perceived by the outside world, mm -hmm. and what is so important to you. You know, I, I, I knew a woman, for example, who was a really terrific actress, terrific. And, uh, and she, she wanted a different life than what an actress's life was, mm -hmm. you know? And she was in such conflict about it. And I think she felt the need to talk to other performers for a long time because she was very much on the radar, as it were. It was so important that she left acting hmm. and decided to become a mom. I mean, that's what she really wanted, you know? It doesn't take away her talent. Right. Her talent is, she's a very talented mom and also a wonderful creative person. But I think, you know, it was important for me to know that I did, I really wanted to be an actress and I would do just about anything to get there <laughs> kind of thing. But you know what I mean? But yeah. it's important mm -hmm. to sure. know yourself, to know how you're perceived by others, and to pursue it in a, in a, really real, yeah, mm -hmm. a realistic, doesn't mean ruthless, a realistic, but you know, and always keep um, challenging yourself. Mm -hmm. it, is, it really is important to keep challenging yourself. Yeah. One thing you said I remember once too was like, we get, it's, especially when you're young, like you, you can get really caught up in the business of it the headshots and the resumes and like, right. make sure that you're like also working on acting, like now and then, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, like make sure that you're like, like a, you know, a musician practices hours and hours every right. single day, no matter yeah. you know, how accomplished you are, you know? So just keep coming back to the craft of it, mm -hmm. you know? Because mm -hmm. also it'll save you when you're not working. Absolutely. You know? yeah. It'll keep your soul alive. Yeah. And it'll save you when you're not working with good people. We've all been on jobs yeah. where you're looking around going, yeah. you want to be a model, you want to be famous, and I'm the only one here who actually wants to tell a story. You have yeah. to be able to, I mean, I don't know, for me, I'm, I'm a big believer in training. I think, mm -hmm. I, I guess I'm kind of old school, but I think you train for a profession. You know, I don't know many doctors who didn't go to med school. I don't know many lawyers right. who didn't pass the bar. Like, I think, right. and, and that exists for a reason, right? You know, when I was in grad school, I did probably... I worked on 50 plays in three years. You can't do that waiting tables in New York. Right. And right. just that experience alone, I think, makes you better. Just exposing yourself to that much material mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. putting yourself in it. And if you're lucky, you get some good advice, but you might not in every grad program. I mean, there's some mm -hmm. terrible, you know, there are acting teachers who consistently ruin their students. And I think it, it also gives you a sense of the backbone that you need to be mm -hmm. in the business. Mm -hmm. I've never had a casting director. I've had people say atrocious things to me. I've never had anybody say anything ruder than they said to me in school. Hmm. And wow. so I walked into New York being like, I, whatever. <laughs> Let me have it, it'll, it'll, it'll roll right off my back. And I think that's important because if you are in a room with a casting director who's gonna just you know, beat you up because they had a bad day, right. Martin Scorsese is still gonna watch that tape. And right. so whatever goes on, you know, one of the smartest things I ever heard somebody say on a set, someone made a mistake and they were about to apologize and he goes, we don't want your story. Huh. Nobody wants right. your story. You know, just do your work. Figure mm -hmm. out a way to do your work really well. Somebody will see your work and maybe you'll get to do more of it. Mm -hmm. Great, great, thank you. Um, well, we do have time for a few questions if anyone has, and it's hard for me to see with the lights if hands are up, but we have somebody over here. And Mitra is coming with a mic. Mm -hmm. Oh, a mic. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, my question. I probably don't need that. <laughs> well, I think it's. Is it so that it'll it'll, it'll come out, out on the tape? Oh, I say okay, okay. Um, I came uh, one night after Memorial Day. I can't remember Wednesday or Thursday, and uh, I was so taken by the uh, audience response throughout your whole performance. Uh, I, I'm a musician, and uh, so I know what it is to be in live theater with a different group every night. So my question is, how, how does the relationship with the audience as your partner fuel or cause you difficulty? Mm. Great, That's a great question. question. Yeah. Take it away, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> um. 
Yeah, you know, it's not really a it's like it's not really a play until there's an audience there. But it's like you can do it in the rehearsal room, and it's a great idea for, of a play. But it's but they are the missing element, you know. Mm -hmm. And you don't find what it is until it's in front of people. Mm -hmm. And this play, more than any play, has I, I think more than any play I've done is like night by night the audience's reaction it it makes it a different event. It is a different yeah. play every night, right? Yeah, I mean, it for sure. it really is. And 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 where people, what, what people latch on to night by night and what they respond to is so vastly different. And it does affect us. I mean, it can't not affect us. Oh, if there's right. a thousand people there, you know? Um, but this is not a play where you know they're always going to laugh here. No, it's no, not. There, it, are, you there, are, you know, there are a few a few of those now and then. And you try not to think about them, because the moment you think about them, they're, they don't want to laugh yeah, anymore. Yeah, right. uh, <laughs> but no, it's not. It's really new and yeah. exciting mm -hmm. that way. Um, and then it can be frustrating when they don't re react like you want them to, you know? Right. It, it is like another, it is like the third character in the room, mm -hmm. you know? And it, it can't not affect you. I think to try to ignore it, I mean, it's not that you want to play to the audience, but you can't. It, it's like ignoring an elephant in a room. I mean, right. there are, mm -hmm. there's all this energy coming your way, and I, I, I really believe that it's an energetic, rhythmic response, you know, give and take. There have been nights where I have been almost blindingly irate at the audience during Act Three, because I, the, the perfect example, two friends of mine, I work with a refugee group, and two friends of mine came, um, and one of them is Eastern European, and one of them is Western European, and the Western European woman saw the play, and she said, it was such a funny play, and the Russian went, how do you laugh at that much pain? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the, <laughs> that's, you, you feel the audience go back and forth, but the first mm -hmm. few audiences we had, there were things they were laughing at in Act Three, and I wanted to be like, "What is funny to you? These are two <laughs> people destroying each other up here." And it took me a long time to kind of get used to it, and it's still shifting sands. We have audiences that come in and they want a rom com, mm -hmm. plain and simple. They want, you know, they want Matthew McConaughey and some blonde girl to make them laugh and for everything to be okay at the end. And then there are audiences that come in that are very, that are willing to go very dark, and there will be minutes of just pin drop silence. Mm. And it's, it's you never know why. Part of the challenge too is, is not to let, you know, it's like you want to let the audience in, but you, like I, our first preview, they, I feel like they steered us. They, they told yeah. us where we were going mm -hmm. and we were not in control, <laughs> like, you know? Yeah. And like this part of the challenge has been like, no, I'm going to move you this way. Yeah, like right. I'm going to move this tank this direction, yeah. you know, and you have This is going to hurt. You have to do that to make, yeah, the, right. to make the play yeah. land like we want it to land. It was very difficult, uh, uh, Gregory actually, when, when he cast me, he said, now look, Halston, you know, you're known as a comedian, and I, this is not a, this is not a rom-com. And, you know, and of course, I'm always, I was always looking for the humor. <laughs> and, you know, particularly in the first couple of the rehearsals, it was very dark and tense, and I was just going, there's got to be a laugh here. There's got to be a laugh here. <laughs> and, and, and there would be, and there would be. And, and, and Gregory kind of really, he, we had a long talk one, one day, and he said, you can make any line funny. I really believe you can. But you can't do that with this play. You can't, mm -hmm. because that's not the story I, want, I need to tell. And he said, We'll find your comfortable factor and what the story is really saying. And it was such great, great advice, and it was such an interesting journey for Mother mm -hmm. to not be the obvious, you know, right. um, ba -da -ba 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 -ba. Thelma Ritter kind yes. of thing, you know, because that's real easy. And, well, it's not easy, really, but, but you know what right. I mean. Yes. Um, and that's when mom, you know, actually is very devastated when in this moment of reveal. Mm -hmm. It was so smart of Richard and, and Greg to go a certain way and go dark. And I think that it has been a challenge every night. Mm -hmm. I have to say, everyone I have spoken to feels this is one of the richer theatrical experiences that they've had. Because Absolutely. It's a complex play. Yes. And then ironically, often, when you're just trying to do it honestly, it is funnier. Yes, you know, yes, that's true. Yes, right, funnier. because yes. it's like this poor deluded guy or, you know, whatever's going on. Yeah. Right, right. Well, thank you. Great question. Uh, is there anyone else uh, that would like to ask? Yes, sir. Hi, guys. Um, 
I read a tweet today from the city paper critic who gave the play a great review, by the way, but um, she said, I wrote 700 plus words about this play and my date was more succinct. He said, every dude should see this play. Every dude. <laughs> so oh. my question is, oh, wow. um, <laughs> what kind of uh, rom uh, relationship lessons do you <laughs> have you gained from the play or do you feel like the play is, is telling? That's a wonderful wow. question. Poor, I mean, can I tell him? Because this is brilliant. Poor Finney got engaged a week before we started rehearsing. Oh. <laughs> and he came yeah. in and, yeah. like, Greg was like, hey, congratulations. I heard you just got engaged. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, it won't be like this. I yeah. promise you. Yeah. It won't be like this. Yeah, I don't know. A friend of mine saw the play, um, and he said, I'm never going to have another girlfriend again. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, I'm done. Yeah, I'm it. done. <laughs> Relationship advice. <laughs> don't marry an actor. Yeah, that is. That is. <laughs> you know? <laughs> don't. I don't know. Go ahead. I, 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 I've been married for over two decades, and, and my husband and I have had many ups and downs in our relationship. And, and this, but I also love that it is a European sort of thing. And this is something I think Europeans understand is that. Uh, You don't need a perfect marriage to have a marriage. Mm -hmm. It's never going to be a perfect marriage. And you know, when she says, women are women, and he says, and men are men, you know, they're never going to be completely in sync. And there's always going to be shifting sands. And it doesn't mean you have to leave. You know, oh, what did I just say? I don't know. But it's true. Yeah. But does that, yeah. you know yeah. what I'm saying? And, and people have said to me, like, why are you and Ralph still so married so long? What's the key to your relationship? Blah, blah, blah. You don't leave the room. That, that's that's mm -hmm. the answer. Mm -hmm. You don't leave. But it doesn't mean you're not going to have a lot of shifting sands. And yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Nelson and I had an interesting, uh, Richard Nelson, the, the translator, uh, and I had an interesting conversation about it on... Uh, opening night, and I, something that I think is interesting for all the things that these two do to each other. Again, this is my perspective as the woman whose job it is to play the actress, but I think one of the greatest kinds of violence that can be done to someone in a marriage is to e expect them to exist the way they were the day you married them and not allow them to change. And there's something, Molnar's kind of a genius, and the more we uncover this play, the more we see it. While we're in the opera, the, the Italian, the, the Puccini that's playing in Madame Butterfly, she's asking him, I hear in your country, you take a butterfly and you stick a pin through her and you keep her on a board. Why would you do that? And he says, to make sure I don't lose her. And they have this whole duet about exactly this phenomenon, and I, I think, from my perspective, the play starts at a moment where a man married a woman, stuck a pin through her, and said, I have this beautiful thing, and now she's mine, and I'm going to keep her on the board. And she's sitting there flapping her wings, going, get this goddamn pin out of me. And that's, that's an interesting moment between a man and a woman in any relationship, or between a man and a man, or a woman and a woman, between mm -hmm. people in any kind mm -hmm. of relationship, where jealousy and possession can come into it. And it's that that starts the action of everything else in the play. Um, and you know, this is a conversation that Richard and I were having about, do these two have a future? And you know, my answer is there's a future as long as that pin comes out. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the, we've talked a lot about the end of the play, and the end of the play could be a million things, but it could also be a moment of going, I don't know, maybe you're not what I thought you were, and maybe mm -hmm. we can allow each other some room mm -hmm. to change and grow, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is a possibility. Or I could be full of pee. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think that's also something that's sort of wonderful about live theater, that it presents all of these different viewpoints uh, simultaneously. So you might think there's a future in this relationship, and you might not. You know what I mean? And the playwright oh, might have some other idea. Right. And, <laughs> and uh, the, the, so what? Because that's true in life. I think this, you think that. And, right. But so, so sort of going off of that, though, so you're, you think that that they aren't just settled back into um, the uh, valley of despond <laughs> that they were in at the beginning, perhaps, but that there might be a future for them. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but that's what you just said. 
for, that from your viewpoint you think she might stay with him, that this might? I think these are two people who saw something different in each other than mm -hmm. they saw yesterday. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they've both been through a battle against each other. They've been through a war, mm -hmm. you know, right. and I think that does change you. And sometimes you need to go through the battle to find out who the other person really mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And I think maybe if he's, a, you know, if he's anything of a healthy person, he, you know, that insidious jealousy that is gnawing away at the relationship might, he might learn to <laughs> try to overcome it. Mm -hmm. um, but also the guardsman is, the guardsman is trying to reclaim um, both his masculinity and also the initial spark that was there when they mm -hmm. first met, mm -hmm. which, which he feels is decaying after six right. months of being together. Right. Um, but that's the thing that he feels that she's over, you know, onto the next one. But that, even that is out of his own self-loathing and self-doubt, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what's gnawing away at it. So the guardsman is trying to, is trying to get that back in a way. And it's also a test to see if she'll actually, you know, ch cheat on him with someone right. else. I mean, it's cr I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. It's and crazy. you want to see if you can get away with it, which is a part of the totally. play that and I love. Totally, and he's an actor, yeah. and like, he's ego is just I wonder you know, if I could. There's a bill. Yeah, there's yeah. A well, that, that's it. that's something I love. That you know, there's the moment in the opera box where you've actually passed the test, and um, it could just stop, but the artist in you wants you to keep stop. on playing the scene. Yeah. Uh, you know, and and yeah. I think that that. Is such a wonderful insight into human beings, but also into, into theater that. people, which yeah. aren't necessarily human beings. For <laughs> 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 Different breed. In quote, um, I I think that we uh, well one one more quick one, and I think we we're sort of at the uh, end. Sarah, you said uh, you haven't done theater in ten years. Uh, you've been doing film and television. Did you have to? get your mind in a different place or relearn something or did you find stuff technologically that had changed since you'd been on the stage? How, how did you I think technologically I was in relatively safe ground. Um, there were, you know, there are muscles that atrophy that you use differently. My voice took a long time. I mean, the first day we were in the stage, the sound guy came up to me and he was like, you're in enormous trouble. <laughs> you're, just, <laughs> you're just never going to make it. Um, and thankfully, Finn's got a huge voice and beautiful and resonant. And I was like, if you just, if you talk the way you need to talk, I will pitch myself to you. And thankfully, you know, I just mm -hmm. could kind of anchor onto that. Um, but, you know, I, there's a part of me that wants to say acting is acting. And I actually very mm -hmm. respectfully completely disagree that things on television are smaller. I think if you look at what's happened in the last five yes, years of television, I, I agree. As you look I at Game of Thrones, you look at, I mean, there's, yes. there's an operatic explosion of intensity yes. in, in terms of what's going on in TV. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not a technique person. I, you know, I was telling Finn, like, what I've learned in the last eight weeks, I don't know how to act. All I can do is, like, listen to somebody honestly and respond in a moment. And I think there are people who've got brilliant technique who, you can take away everything, all the costumes, all the sets, all the other actors, and they won't change. I'm not one of those people. And so if I'm able to like hang on stage for a couple hours, 95% of that is thanks to Finn and Schuler and Julie mm -hmm. and Greg and Richard. You know what I mean? Like I, I really believe that there's only one way for me to do this. And that's, you know, people hand you their people hand you your performance. My job is to hand them theirs by giving them something to look at that's honest. But, I, you know, I was in a room with eight or nine phenomenally talented, dedicated, beating hearts going, all right, well, if that's what you're doing, then here, take this back. And that was kind of all the thinking, apart from, God help me, I need to be heard. Mm -hmm. um, that was kind of all the thinking that went into it. I maybe should have done other thinking. And <laughs> we'll see. I, I don't read reviews, so we'll see. No, no. I do I, have to go get a wig on, though. I, yes. These guys and, and, and don't have to come until later. We're, no, no. We're, I, we're at time. I do want to say, though, that even as the words were coming out of my mouth about the television thing, I, 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 I wanted to snatch them back. I was trying to make a point about, especially my students who think small, small is real and right, big small. isn't. Sure. But uh, when you think about the Borgias, uh, Sex in the City. I mean, all of yeah, these shows. The Sopranos. There. Yeah, the Sopranos. That's right. It, yeah. it, it's it's operatic. So you're you're absolutely right. 
Um, I just want to say that this production and your performances in it make us think about relationships, makes us think about illusion and reality and all kinds of really important human uh, dilemmas and conditions. And it's a pleasure listening to you talk, and it's a pleasure watching you act. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Yes. And thank you.